The person who is going to be speaking to you for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm sure everyone is quite well aware, is one of the great public intellectuals of our time. Tony has written about 32, 34 books. I'm sure there's another one ready to come off the press as we speak. And he is, I think, single-handedly responsible for a lot of the reshaping, both of modern sociology and a lot of other fields. His work is terribly influential in communication as well as many other social scientists. And then I think what's most interesting about Tony is that after being a Cambridge professor, he decided that wasn't enough. And he decided to go on, and he's the head of the London School of Economics, where he is also reshaping that university and has made incredible strides and is growing their faculty and their student body from what was already an incredibly esteemed and wonderful university. And then finally, I think a lot of people who may not be were, uh, familiar with his academic work are quite well aware of the fact that the press refers to Tony as Tony Blair's guru and one of the chief architects of the third way politics. And so we are so very, very happy to have him here today. And after the talk is over, we're going to leave time for question and answer. Welcome. Thank you. Well, I shouldn't need that microphone because this one should uh, work. Um, can I say thanks, Patty, for that um, very nice and generous introduction? Most of it lies, but nevertheless, <laughs> very nice introduction. And I'm very pleased that um, the LSC is uh, now collaborating with the Annenberg School, and we're developing a number of joint projects which uh, I think will Im be important to both institutions. Well, the theme of uh, this lecture is uh, what I would describe as a world which has taken us by surprise. If you look back to the late 18th century, late 18th century was the time at which the great philosophers were pondering the fate of industrial civilization, the Enlightenment philosophers. The Enlightenment philosophers had a, a clear view of what our world would be like. 200 years on. And this was based on a fairly simple, but I think very plausible uh, precept, very, very simple theorem. The more we get to know about the world with the advance of science and technology, the more we get to know about ourselves and our own uh, history, um, the more we can come to master the world, control the world, control our fate as uh, human beings. This was the characteristic, with some simplification, Enlightenment view of the world. Enlightenment would bring a more predictable, orderly world. And even those people who uh, didn't really like this world too much, like uh, the famous uh, sociologist Max Weber, or the novelist Kafka, or George Orwell, they still believed in this vision. They foresaw an orderly world in which we would all be like cogs in a gigantic machine. Weber's main worry for the future was that the world would be too tightly ordered, too tightly controlled, so that we wouldn't have any freedoms as individuals. Now I suggest to you, if you um, look at our experience today, the beginning of the 21st century, um, the world does not look like this. The world in which we live, the beginning of the new century, does not look like a tightly ordered rationally controlled world. Rather, it looks almost like the opposite, a world which is spinning out of our control, a world marked by fracturing, by dislocation, by a generalized feeling of uncertainty, which I think is reflected not only in uncertainties about the large institutions in the world in which we live, but uncertainties about our personal lives, our personal futures, our own intimate emotions too. Rather than being an ordered world, we live in what I'd sometimes call a runaway world, a world which is lurching towards futures which we don't fully understand. The Enlightenment thought of the future as like a kind of territory, and uh, it was a bit like a, a colonial venture. They thought with, with the development of science and technology, we will be able to conquer the territory of the future. Well, we haven't conquered that territory. The future to us looks perhaps even more opaque than it used to do in the past. 
theme of this lecture really is what our life is like in this runaway world and what we can do to regulate and control it. Now, there, there are a number of dynamic forces which have produced uh, this runaway world, but there's no doubt that one of the forces lying behind it, or the cluster of forces, is, is that related to the, the notion which was in the title of this lecture, the impact of globalization. Now, the debate about globalization, I would like to propose to you, is the single most important debate of the beginning part of this century. The reason being is that it's a debate about what kind of world we're able to shape for ourselves, what kind of world we will be living in 10 or 20 or so years from now. The resolution of this debate, which is a very practical as well as an intellectual debate, will settle those questions. So I'm going to concentrate a lot of what I have to say around the globalization debate, but you should remember this is only one set of forces leading to this dislocation with the Enlightenment project, which is characteristic of the late 20th century, first part of the 21st century. Now, the debate about globalization is a really amazing thing, and uh, you have to start, I think, to understand that debate with the history of the term. Term globalization, not very attractive term, right? Fairly ugly term. But the amazing thing about it is how recently it's come into general currency. If you go back only about 12 years ago, um, I wrote a book called The Consequences of Modernity. At that time, uh, even in the intellectual debate, the term globalization actually wasn't used very much at all. People used to speak of internationalization, of the world order, of the world system, but the term globalization didn't figure very much in the academic literature. It didn't figure very much in the business literature, and you certainly didn't find it in the newspapers or, or, or in the speeches of politicians. Over a period of something like just over a decade, the term globalization has gone from being nowhere to being everywhere. Today, you can't open a newspaper without mention, or at least if you read the first few pages of the newspaper, without mention of the term globalization. Coming over here on the plane, you open up, or I opened up the, the magazine you get on the airline, and the first article I saw was the economic consequences of globalization. You can't, uh, going back to Tony Blair, listen to a speech by Tony Blair without mention of the notion of globalization, something for which I take some personal responsibility. <laughs> I think it is a pretty important thing. Now, when a term goes from being nowhere to, to being everywhere in such a short period of time, it's not surprising that it produces controversy. And this is certainly true of the discussion of, of what globalization is, what it means, what its consequences are. You can separate out, however, two phases in the globalization debate. By the way, the globalization debate is itself global. It's a kind of expression of what it's about. I've been to many countries over the last two or three years, haven't been to a single country where there isn't an intense debate about what globalization is and, and what, its, what its implications are for our lives. So you're dealing with a global debate about very nature of what the global is, but this debate has gone through two phases. The first one was what I, what, what I will call the early globalization debate. The early globalization debate was a debate between those who disbelieved in the idea, who were skeptical of the idea that there's anything particularly new going on in the contemporary world, versus those who argued that the current age of globalization is distinctive from the past. You can call the first group the globalization skeptics. The globalization skeptics essentially argue that there's nothing new in the world. So that if you, for example, look back 100 years ago to the late 19th century, in the late 19th century, you already had many of the features now associated with globalization today. So the skeptics argued. Late 19th century, you had an uh, open market in commodities, you had a fairly liberal marketplace across uh, at least chunks of the world. You had a good deal of trade in currencies. Uh, you had a lot of migration across the world, of course, including into the United States. And in the late 19th century, passports barely existed. So uh, the skeptics say, well, look, what's new? If, at the most, the current phase of, of globalization is simply a reversion to the late 19th century. 
This was the early globalization debate. This debate, I would suggest to you, is now over. Over the past uh, five or six years, uh, we've had a large number <coughs> of empirical studies of, as it were, globalization then and globalization now, which I think show clearly that the globalization skeptic position is mistaken. Those who argued that there isn't much that's distinctive about our age were wrong. I don't, I don't think anyone can look at the literature in detail and doubt that this is the case. It's fairly easy to show, for example, in, in a strictly economic sense, with the advent of global uh, electronic financial markets. Uh, only about uh, 20 or so years ago, only a few hundred million dollars were turned over every day in global currency markets. Now, according to the latest estimate, two trillion dollars are turned over every day. And this happens in an instantaneous uh, set of communications across the world on a 24-hour basis. There was nothing like that in the late 19th century. Late 19th century, if you like, was the first era of globalization, but is substantively different from the current era. I would like to propose to you that, that we are living in the first global age. We are the first generation to be citizens in something like an emerging global cosmopolitan society. And as I'll suggest in a minute, communications are crucial to the, the driving forces underlying this process. But just as you can show in the case of financial markets, you can show in the case of other technologies and other social changes that this is different from the past. So that old debate is over, I think. Now, most students of globalization agree that globalization today is a reality. It's different from the past. It's more intense. It's more comprehensive. No one more or less across the world is left outside as they were in the late 19th century. This is, in many respects, a new world which we're entering, and we are pioneers in, in this new world. We're struggling as academics and as everyday uh, citizens to understand that, that the forces that are shaping this world. We've now moved on to the second globalization debate. The second globalization debate is no longer about whether or not globalization is a reality, whether or not the, the current age is different from the past. It's about the consequences of globalization. And that debate, as everyone sitting in the room here will recognize and will know, is no longer an academic debate. It's gone out into the streets. Ever since the WTO meetings in Seattle, going on to two big marches in London, going on to protests against uh, IMF policy in Buenos Aires, and recently to the uh, somewhat violent confrontations in the streets of Prague, when the international organizations were meeting there, the debate about globalization is an active, politicized, to some extent, direct confrontation between those, in some sense, promoting globalizing forces and those who proclaim themselves to be against. And those who proclaim themselves to be against, of course, want to put an end to, reverse, put into reverse gear the changes which they see happening around them. And it's this debate which should occupy us. This debate is about what globalization is, but more crucially, what it is doing to the world. It is no longer a debate about whether or not it exists, because we can accept that many of these changes are indeed new. And it's crucial, really, to decide what the consequences, implications, political, economic, cultural, social, are for us. Now, the debate in the streets, on the face of it, is a debate between those who are for globalization. They're sitting inside plush auditoriums like this with the air conditioning on, and they're discussing the advance of the global marketplace and what the IMF should do about global economic crises. And those who are, quote, against globalization are outside. They're carrying their placards. They're the members of non-governmental organizations, NGOs. They're from ecological groups. They're a kind of uh, uh, variety of people from different political, cultural backgrounds who want to contest 
the shape of the world as they see it and they want to argue that a different world should be constructed from the one which is being built from inside the air-conditioned auditoria where the establishment figures sit. I want to assess what this debate means a bit later but I'd first of all like to strongly suggest to you that you cannot be for or against globalization. That therefore, both sides in this debate start from a position which is essentially incoherent or untenable. The reason why you can't just be for or against globalization is that globalization is not a single force. It's absolutely central, at least to my way of thinking about these issues, to emphasize that the term globalization does not just stand for the global marketplace, does not just stand for the role of global financial markets, does not just stand for liberalization of the global economy. I, th I take this to be a fundamental misapprehension of, of the changes which are really going on in the world, which are much more profound than this. Globalization is not a single phenomenon, it does not have a single source. You're talking about technological change, you're talking about the end of the Cold War, you're talking about transformations in political sovereignty, you're talking about the exhaustion of socialism as an ideology across the world. There are a cluster of factors shaping what the term is using quotes really, globalization, because there's something rather different from how people ordinarily think of this phenomenon going on. You can't be for it or against it, you have to be for or against different aspects of it. You have to piece together what is a complicated phenomenon work out what its benefits are for us because I think there are plenty but also work out what its destructive or negative downside is. One should therefore not understand by globalization purely an economic phenomenon even less than that should one understand by globalization simply the liberalization of the global economy. What is it then that, that how should one understand the term? I would like to suggest the following globalization is fundamentally a shorthand term to refer to a fundamental restructuring of the basic institutions of the societies in which we live. Stretching all the way through from everyday life through to structures of sovereignty through to transnational associations. There's like a seismic shift in, in the structuring <coughs> of the basic institutions of our societies which is occurring. And you could, if you like, compare this, as some people do, to the late 18th century, because at that time um, you had like a, a, a sort of shakeout of, of basic institutions under the impact of the Industrial Revolution. You had change in the nature of the family, change in the nature of government, change in the nature of the economy, of course, and also changes in the wider world system. Well, something like that, a kind of analog to that, but much more globalized, much more extensive, and much more intensive because it reaches down into our personal lives much more is going on today. The term, some people now suggest the term globalization should be abandoned because it covers a variety of different phenomena. I must say I have some sympathy with that because uh, if you use it as a, as a single term, you do imagine you can be for it or against it and you oversimplify both the dynamic causes of changes in the world and, and you, over, you underestimate, I think, the, the profundity of some of these changes. So globalization is not wholly economic. It is also social, cultural, political, certainly shifting the sovereign power of nations without uh, completely transforming them. And it's also reaching down to very, I think, very personal, emotional aspects of our everyday lives uh, too. If you want to understand, if you want a kind of graphic picture, kind of topological picture of what globalization is, should see it as a series of threefold forces working in some part in opposition to one another. Globalization certainly draws some power away from the nation into a wider global order. We know that it does this including economic powers that nations used to have. On the other hand, globalization also has the opposite effect. It doesn't just pull away from the nation, it also pushes down. It creates new forces promoting local autonomy, a local cultural identity, uh, a resurgence of local nationalism, 
in many parts of the world. If you ask why uh, there is a resurgence of local nationalism uh, in Northern Ireland, in Quebec, in Catalonia, in Kashmir, in many other parts of the world, the answer is certainly bound up with globalization. Globalization creates this kind of counter pressure towards devolution, decentralization of power, a kind of resurgence of interest in local cultural autonomy. But if globalization pulls away and globalization pushes down, globalization also spreads sideways. It creates new regions, some of which cross cut the boundaries between nations. Um, you see such a region, for example, surrounding Barcelona in uh, northern Spain. Barcelona and Catalonia are part of the Spanish nation still, but they are autonomous regions within Spain with a great deal of local autonomy. The economy of Barcelona, the economy of Catalonia is closely linked into uh, that of southern France and more generally into the overall economy of the European Union. So Barcelona and Catalonia are, are in Spain, but they're not of Spain. You also have global cities which are in a country, but not so much of a country. This is true of the city of London, for example, the financial center of London, which is plainly a globalized organization located in London, but nevertheless is, is linked to a network which, which stretches across the world. So you have a multiple series of reconfigurations of the global society which is happening under the impact of, of globalization. Just as I think is it's wrong to limit the notion of globalization to the global economy, it's also, I think, wrong to see the primary driving forces of, of the new global age as simply economic or technological. Certainly not just in the area anyway of, uh, of the technologies of the world economy. I think this is crucial for communication and for uh, students of communication. The main driving force of the new global age, I think, is, is the communications revolution. Or, or the series of communications revolutions which have happened over the past 30 or so years. If you wanted to have a technological fix on the, on the beginnings of the new global age, you would put it, I think, in the uh, late 1960s, very early 1970s. This was the time at which the first effective commercial satellites were sent up above the Earth. Once you have a, a satellite network ringing the Earth, once this is connected with computer technology, it's not just the, the structure of global organizations that shift. Many things in our life shift. Instantaneous electronic communication introduces a new set of moving influences in the world. Now, I think it's true to say that these influences, for example, underlay the 1989 revolutions in Eastern Europe. They underlay the the collapse of the Soviet Union. They underlay also the changes which brought to an end apartheid in South Africa and initiated the peace process in the Middle East, which at the moment is undergoing this uh, unfortunate and horrible um, regression. If you look at the history of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was fairly competitive economically and its authority structure was functional politically um, up until about the end of the 1960s, even if you allow for false uh, uh, economic statistics kept within that country. Soviet Union became uncompetitive, became out of line with the wider world when you got the emergence of a much more fluid, electronically based uh, global order, and which uh, was unable to compete economically in the new globalizing information economy, but was also dysfunctional politically in, the, in a world which calls for much greater flexibility, localization of power, and in which the, the authoritarian command system of the Soviet Union became like a dinosaur almost overnight. And I think you did have a kind of global electronic dialogue, really, going on around the 1989 revolutions in which the influence of television was very plain and clear, extending through to South Africa and other areas of the world, where there was like a global dialogue about democratization. It seems to me that there is a structural connection between the spread of a global information society and the expansion of parliamentary democracy across the world. Uh, by recent calculations, even if you allow for the fact that there are a lot more countries in the world than there used to be, um, there are about three times as many um, 
democratic, clearly democratic systems in the world as they were 30 or so years ago. That is not an accidental conjunction. The reason is, I think, that in a globalizing information society, old forms of hard political power become much less relevant to the functioning of a society than they were in the past. And in an open information environment, you have a much more active citizenry than you ever had in the past. And this creates strong impulsions towards democracy. At the same time, interestingly, it tends to subvert it because at the same time as, as, as you get the spread of global communications, and you get an intrinsic thrust towards democratization, you also get a weakening of democratic institutions by the very self-same processes. And that's the reason why you get widespread disaffection with political leaders, uh, lowered rates of voting participation in, in uh, many countries across the world, and a general skepticism about political process. And it's largely because voters are much more informed than they used to be, and they won't put up with the sorts of defects in the political process which many voters used to accept across the world. So you have a kind of crisis of democracy at the same time as you get a spread of democracy across the world. And I think one of the things about the media is the media open up, you know, a space for public debate. That's what the media can do. But they relentlessly close down this space through a trivialization of issues, personalization of issues, direct uh, 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 engagement with, with the seamy side of politics. And, these things have certainly changed the structure of political power because they, they tend to sideline parliament or they tend to sideline congress because most politicians spend a lot of their time in a direct engagement with the media on an everyday basis and that's produced what some people call media democracy. Media democracy is pretty different from uh, traditional forms of representative democracy, whatever you make of it. So you have a number of stresses and strains going around these issues. These changes do not, however, produce the end of the nation state. Um, there are no fewer than three books which I've come across called The End of the Nation State, in which people have argued with the emergence of the new global age, you know, nations become largely irrelevant um, because uh, global forces um, supplant national power. And some people say that's one reason for disillusionment with uh, politics. It, these things are not, I think, valid assertions. Rather than, than saying this is an age of, of the trend the transcendence of the nation state, I think you could say this is in a way the age of the high point of the nation state because in all previous eras there were empires, imperial systems which existed alongside nations. Uh, so you could say I think that the Soviet empire which ended in 1989 was the last empire really on the global scene. Now every state is a nation state so the nation state has become a universal form and even those local nationalisms, like in Quebec or elsewhere, that want autonomy, well, they want to set up their own nations, their own nation states. So although nation state is becoming transformed, plainly, it isn't what it used to be. It's lost some aspects of its sovereignty. Nations have to collaborate to uh, introduce some of the changes which we might regard as desirable in the world scene. It's quite forced to suppose that the nation state has lost its role in the global world. It, it hasn't. Uh, for reasons I'll come back to right at the end, um, national political leadership is crucial to resolving some of the problems which the runaway world has created for us. Just finally going through this kind of conceptualization of globalization, it, it's just as essential as these other points for me to argue that globalization is not just an out there phenomenon. Many people, politicians and people who run businesses and so on, people in government, tend to think of globalization as a purely external set of forces to which we all have to respond. But this is not the case. We are all participants in globalization. <clears throat> we are all active participants in these processes. I don't have to say that every time you turn on a computer, you are not just reacting to a global world. You are participating in the creation of that global world. But these things are true in a much more intimate level about personal and emotional life too, not just technological life. All across the world, for example, there is currently a debate about the future of the family. The only countries where there is not a debate about the future of the family is where it is actively repressed by authoritarian uh, regimes. Why is there such a debate? Well, because you have global changes in the position of women, 
You have global changes in the nature of personal relationships. Personal relationships now are quite different from what traditional marriage used to be like in, in, in many um, societies. The emancipation of women and entry of women into the labor force is one of the great global changes of the contemporary era and you have to treat it as just as important to the wider set of changes associated with globalization as the forces that are more ordinarily associated with that term. term. The globalization kind of invades our personal lives. It even forces us to think differently about who we are as individuals. Very closely associated with globalizing forces as a kind of retreat of culture and tradition from the structuring of our life. The past doesn't have the same role in our life as it used to do. When this is so, this means you have to live a much more active life. You don't just have a self. You have to develop a self. You have to have an active self. And our relations with other people are no longer structured by tradition, by and large, or only to some degree in many countries across the world. That means that if you look at what marriage is, marriage a generation ago was a kind of status transition. You knew what you were doing, as it were. Now when you get married, there's a certain sense in which you don't know what you're doing because you're operating against the background of major and imponderable changes in people's lives and marriage has now become founded upon communication. That's why we talk so much about relationships. The very idea of a relationship was only invented over the past 30 or so years. In a relationship, you have to gain the active emotional trust of the other. That's what it's all about. That's very different from the, the foundations of traditional marriage and traditional emotional life. So right at the other pole of these great global changes, you have immense changes in, in personal identity, the emotions, the sort of tissue of everyday life, which are just as crucial as the big changes. And as we know, if you look at the fate of President Clinton, intimately re re involved with electronic technologies, you get sexuality, power, global consciousness of personal details of what went on in the White House, a quite extraordinary conjunction of these circumstances, a kind of everyday thing really in our lives today in a globalizing world. So in sum then, this, this in my view is a period of major social, cultural, political, economic shift. We don't know what the consequences will be of some of the big changes affecting our lives. We don't, all of us feel a kind of sense of drift I think in our personal life, a kind of runaway world I described at the beginning is deeply, deeply bound up in our own consciousness because I think the feeling of uncertainty about who we are, what we should aim for, how we relate to other people, these, these are just as part of this new age as, as, as the big structural changes uh, which are usually lumped under the term globalization. Now if you take this point of view, I think you have a different uh, uh, reaction to the uh, practical encounters that went on in Seattle and, and elsewhere than you would do otherwise. And I'd now like in the last part of the lecture to come to the theme of, of what the consequences of globalization are and what we should make of this massive practical engaged debate which is unfolding on the streets around the actions of the international organizations. I'd like to make three points about these confrontations about how one, what kind of take one should have on them. First, I think you have to see that if, if, as I said at the beginning, you can't just be for or against globalization, the struggle between the protesters in the streets of Seattle and the, the people sitting inside their air-conditioned rooms is not really a struggle of those who are involved in globalization and those who are not. Although there are certain overtones of that which I'll come to in a minute. The one way of showing this, I think, is to consider what I thought was a very funny but also instructive placard that someone was holding up in the Seattle meetings, one of the protesters, which said, join the worldwide movement against globalization. <laughs> well, what does that show you? <laughs> what it shows you is that the protesters are just as much part of globalizing processes as are those who they are contesting. And we know that the people who gathered in Seattle used the internet to do so. We know that uh, NGOs and other organizations themselves have a global spread. So what you're talking about here is not one set of people inside globalizing processes, the others outside. That is not it at all, really. 
you're talking about a kind of engagement between you, what you might call globalization from above, the, the expansion of the marketplace, uh, Western technologies, uh, big firms moving around the world, and globalization from below. The globalization from below is in its way just as powerful, just as extensive as globalization from, from above. If you look at the uh, history of NGOs, for example, over the past 30 or so years, 30 years ago, there were only a few hundred NGOs in the world. Latest count, there are 30,000 NGOs. Many of these have true global spread, like Greenpeace or Oxfam or whatever. Um, many of them have as great a global spread as some of the giant corporations do. So you're dealing with a struggle between the two sides of globalization, which are engaged in a dialogue, and I think you have to say this dialogue is justified. That is to say, the protesters on the streets did have important points to make, and these points must be considered by anyone who looks on, on the debate about globalization from its political uh, point of view and wants to say, well, what kind of forces are they and how should we best shape them to make the world a better place? Now, the people who are in the streets were a diverse, uh, motley crew of people, but I think as agents of globalization themselves, they were bringing up at least two points uh, which concern many of the protesters. And these form my second and third points of the three points I mentioned. First, or second if you like, they were concerned with corporate power, and they were saying, well look, corporations have much too much power in the contemporary world. Corporations dominate the world, they should not do so. They're run by unelected people. They're based primarily in the West, you know, a kind of expression of Western domination, of, of uh, globalization. Globalization is essentially a Western project foisted upon the rest of the world willy-nilly. Those are the kinds of things that I think were said. And the other thing they were saying, which will constitute my third point in a minute, is that globalization is associated with an expansion of inequality. It produces uh, relatively small groups of winners or relatively small groups of people um, across the world who profit from these processes. It leaves many others uh, in a situation of poverty or exclusion so that globalization is associated with increasing inequalities of wealth and income um, across the world. And the protesters were arguing this is wrong and therefore globalization should be put into reverse. My argument from the beginning was that it's much harder to do this than you might imagine because it's a much more complicated set of processes anyway. But let me look at these two points. So I'm making three points, one being the people on the streets were themselves part of globalizing processes. Second, role of corporate power. Are the protesters right and in what sense are they right to protest against the role of corporations? Uh, the big companies, big firms, global companies, in shaping the world in which we live. Well, you start with the idea that corporations rule the world. There's a, uh, a book which has now become famous, written by David Corton, K-O-R-T-E-N, called When Corporations Rule the World. Uh, by that title, he meant that corporations already rule the world, and that they've become much more powerful than nations. How valid is this? Well, in my view, it's not particularly valid, I have to say. I think nations, nation states, are more powerful than corporations and will remain more powerful than corporations, whether one's talking about Western nations or developing or so-called third world nations. The reasons for this, I think, are pretty clear. Um, nations control territory, corporations don't. Nations control, whether individually or collectively, an apparatus of law. Corporations don't. Nations, whether acting individually or collectively, control the means of violence or military power. Corporations don't. So although you have very large corporations, which certainly have much more wealth than, than poorer countries in the world, it does not follow from this that corporations do the, rule the world. They do not, and they will not do so. There are other reasons for supposing that corporate power is more limited than the protesters assert. One is the very rise of NGOs and uh, the globalization 
of culture and agency across the world. Um, if you look at the history of Monsanto Corporation, at one moment Monsanto uh, led the world in genetically modified uh, uh, crops or technologies producing those crops. He seemed to have an almost impregnable position. The next moment it was almost blown out of the marketplace because it underestimated the power of consumer groups, ecological groups in Europe and elsewhere. And the company essentially had to radically restructure in order to meet these protests. Moreover, the world of corporate power is a highly volatile one, uh, probably much more volatile than it used to be in the past. I think it's true to say that if you look at the top 15 corporations in the world today, and you compare them with the top 15 corporations 20 years ago, not a single corporation 20 years ago that was in the top uh, 10 or 15 is in the top or 10, 15 today mainly because the whole rise of new big corporations like Cisco Systems, uh, uh, Microsoft and so on have now invaded the top arenas of corporate power. In addition, I think it's uh, foolish to demonize corporations. Reasons being is that you need corporate uh, investment, especially in poorer parts of the world, if you are to generate economic development. So the problem for us, I think, with corporate power is how we should effectively regulate it. it. There is no future in saying that we should simply try to constrain the activities of big corporations so that they don't touch the developing world. Almost the opposite is needed. A lot of capital is withdrawn from the developing world where it needs to be. And we need to create a society which generates adequate investment and which effectively regulates corporate power. So to me, the issue of corporations really comes down to the issue of regulation. I think we do need a great deal more regulation of the activity of corporations. I think a good deal of this has to be transnational. It can't be purely national. This has to uh, concern uh, areas of contestation like uh, local labor standards, uh, minimum wages in developing parts of the world. It has to concern ecological issues. It has to concern uh, monopoly in, uh, in, in corporate sectors across the world. And it also has to concern tax havens. Um, I'm strongly in favor of the innovations that OECD have just introduced to uh, produce much greater regulation of tax havens, because tax havens uh, uh, are noxious, I think, elements within the global economy where unpleasant uh, political leaders stash their ill-gotten gains, but also where corporations escape their tax <coughs> or fiscal responsibilities. We should therefore be looking to create, as far as we can, uh, an effective system of, of, uh, of corporate global governance, which tries to ensure good global citizenship on the part of corporations. And I think this needs a mixture of active regulation and incentives, both nationally and internationally. What we do not want, however, is to have a situation where corporations will not invest in poorer areas of the world. And I believe there are a range of strategies which actually can effectively bring capital to less developed parts of the world. Now, there are plenty of other issues in all of that. I don't have time to discuss in a, in a short lecture, but at least I would say the role of corporate power is more nuanced, more two-sided, than you, you might think from the activities of demonstrators in the streets. What about the third thing, global inequality? Is it true that globalization is producing a world with increasing inequalities between the rich and the poor? And I think the answer to this, we have a lot of material on this now, a lot of material produced over the past five or six years or so. And I think the answer to that is no, whatever definition of globalization you use. Even if you do use a very narrow definition of globalization, where globalization simply means the spread of free markets or liberalization of the global economy, there is no clear correlation, studies show, between the liberalization of poorer economies and the expansion of inequalities, either within those societies or, or more globally. Um, Insofar as there is a correlation, it suggests that liberalization of poorer economies reduces inequality rather than promotes uh, inequality. 
if you look at statistics on economic growth, um, poorer countries which were closed economies uh, over the past 20 years have more or less zero growth rate on average. Poorer countries with open economies have an average growth rate of about 4.6% over that period. So it is not the case that globalization and inequality are in some intrinsic sense linked, so the expansion of globalization produces more inequality. This is not to say, however, that one should be simply an advocate of free trade, because it's pretty obvious that free trade can be very destructive of a local subsistence economy if it doesn't have uh, other industries which can allow it to survive fluctuations in world commodity prices. It would be quite wrong, I think, simply to advocate open free market policies for all poorer countries. Nevertheless, the evidence, I think, is pretty clear on these issues. No country which stands outside global processes can hope to prosper. Those countries that have sought to isolate themselves, like North Korea or Burma, are among the poorest countries in the world. There is no future, I feel, for protectionism or regionalism. The, the questions for poorer countries are all to do with the conditions under which one engages with the wider global economy and the other socio-political changes happening in the world. Moreover, I think you have to also accept, if you look at studies of these issues, that internal political change is also crucial. That is, poorer countries can produce changes which will allow effective involvement in wider global processes. And richer countries should help them to make these changes. These include democratization. They include more transparency, especially of banking institutions. They include the building of effective forms of civil society. They, in they include active anti-poverty strategies. They include, I, I would hope anyway, resources which continue to flow from richer countries to poorer countries. But we know there is only one way to tackle global poverty which is available to us. That way is economic development in which the poor participate. Now during the period when people simply believed in free markets, there was as it were the dominance of neoliberal ideology, we know that did not happen. You had economic development in many poorer parts of the world in which the poor did not participate. You must have active government strategy going along with uh, opening up to free markets if you're going to generate economic development which alleviates poverty. But we know from Asian countries that it has happened. We know that there have been millions of people leveraged out of poverty much faster than has ever happened in the world economy before. And we know this has happened from engagement with the wider world, not disengagement. From it. As a result of these things, I think you can, in any way, develop a reasonable and possibly effective overall strategy for addressing the issues of what I called in the beginning the runaway world. Our world stands in, in need of greater economic governance. It stands in need of greater coordination between currencies. I believe political leaders should, should at least consider um, the Tobin tax, which is the idea has been around for 25 years, a small tax on global currency transactions, the results of which would be used to fund economic development in poorer countries. I think the richer countries of the world should declare a war on poverty and they should seek to meet the United Nations objective, which is halving world poverty uh, by the year 2025, I think it is. It seems to me to be a realistic objective if you've got a conjunction of forces behind it. We don't simply have to take these forces for granted. Greater governance is needed in order to achieve them. In conclusion, there's an enormous amount at stake because what's at stake is, is not repeating our past history, I think. If you go back 100 years to what I called the first age of globalization, people then, the end of the 19th century, were talking about world government. They were talking about a fruitful, prosperous world economy. They believed that warfare would be a thing of the past. What happened? You've got the rise of fascism in Europe. You've got two world wars. More than 200 million people have been killed in war during the 20th century. Can we avoid that history? Can we make sure the 21st century does not repeat the pattern of the 20th century? The omens are not all good, as we know, because in Europe you have a resurgence of the far right, 
You have ethnic hatreds in many parts of the world, and the collapsing peace process in the Middle East. You do have enormous tensions in the different areas of the world, but I feel there is at least a reasonable perspective shift in world society which is not wholly utopian. The second global age is much more intense, as I said before, it's much more comprehensive. It offers much greater scope for the creation of a world cosmopolitan community, and that's where we should put our efforts. In this generation, we can hope to create such a community, and we can hope at least to shape the 21st century in a way which would be very different from the fateful history of the 20th. Thank you very much. There's a microphone going wrong, I think. Could you comment on uh, the issue of uh, deputy for the uh, impoverished nations uh, that such campaigns as Jubilee 2000 are people who are advocating a writing off or... Uh, and we're... Uh, deputy for the Florida Nations was the first question. Could you comment on the that? The microphone is working, is it? Uh, no, it's not. It's just coming this is supposed to be a communications department. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I asked uh, Dr. Gibbs to comment on the issue of debt relief for the poorer nations and the Jubilee 2000 campaign. Why don't I answer that question yeah. before we go on the next one? Because um, I've been working fairly closely with Jubilee 2000, and uh, I think it's a central thing to push ahead with debt relief, even though progress, as you know, has been very slow. But you absolutely mustn't treat it as a panacea, because the countries that do get debt relief should be strongly encouraged to restructure their institutions. Otherwise, the whole thing will repeat itself again because we know a lot of the debt it was built up by um, uh, corrupt political leadership. And in many cases, that corrupt political leadership is still in place. So that's why I think you can't overstress the importance of endogenous change within poorer countries to go along with debt relief if it's going to be effective. Otherwise, you'll simply have a repeat of the same situation all over again. So that's not easy to do, but those two things, to some extent, have to go together. Uh, thank you. The other question was prompted by your citing of Max Weber at the beginning of your lecture, and <laughs> I'm an a, a, a avid reader of Weber's work, and uh, he talks a lot about religion and the of primal importance of religion in uh, forming attitudes toward commerce and a whole host of other cultural institutions, and I wonder if you could comment on the role of religion in, in this new global uh, well, Yeah, but that wasn't, that wasn't the aspect of Weber's writings I was referring to. I was referring more to where he talks about the idea that we would all be cogs in a gigantic machine. Because he thought, here we live in a technological civilization, along with technology you'll get like human machines, which are bureaucracies, and all of us will be simply functionals functionary cogs in those, in those machines. As I was trying to say, this has not turned out to be the case. It, things look almost the opposite of that, really. Um, but, but the, the bureaucra religion, bureaucratization and secularization went, went hand in hand, as he, in his theory, as I, as I understand it. And so, well, uh, I mean, Weber's, you... Weber's prophecy of the spread of bureaucracy has not really proved to be valid. And so, when you had, for example, um, uh, assembly line production a generation ago, big hierarchical firms, most of that has broken down. The question of religion, I think, is largely separate from that. Um, Weber thought that, actually, that religion would tend to disappear from the world, just like Durkheim did. He thought that religion was very important in the expansion of capitalism and um, had various consequences for economic development. But uh, most of the 19th century, turn of the century sociologists thought that the influence of religion would be less in the contemporary world. This has not, I think, proven to be the case. And, characteristic feature of our world is persistence of religious divisions, but also the persistence of what you might call religiosity, a religious feeling, which, which I think will never go away because I think all of us stand in some relationship to eternity after all, religiosity comes from the finitude of human existence, so religiosity will not go away. That's not the same as the origins of religious divisions, and we certainly have to try to overcome some of those. Um, and everyone is conscious of the fact that there are still major religious ethnic 
conflicts which are raging in different parts of the world. So I think the 19th century sociologists were not all that accurate about that. But I think that's a lot, it's not a completely separate theme, but it's not what I was directly discussing in the comments I made at the beginning. Do you want to um, I don't, either shout or get the mic? Yeah, I, I will. Uh, when you were talking about Monsanto, there's, there's a mic yeah. you can speak about We can hear you if you shout anyway. I can. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. You're right down there? <laughs> yeah. Um, when you talked about uh, Monsanto and uh, the fact that NGOs here uh, were powerful enough to stop Monsanto, now the same Monsanto is now in India trying to, you know, yeah. uh, go with the genetic, uh, genetically modified uh, products. And uh, unfortunately, the unequal trade, you know, terms of globalizations are such in India that it may not provide the same kind of uh, platform of resistance uh, which was seen here. And uh, you know, so I was wondering when you talk about richer countries helping out poor countries, whether those unequal terms of globalization, which you know. Uh, are seen in these two different contexts uh, would be taken into account because that is something that is a very uh, you know important issue as far as you know the Indian protesters against globalization are concerned yeah, sure. and I think they're not against globalization per se because they realize that it is a globalized world but uh, the fact that these unequal terms of globalization are what they are concerned about and worried about yeah I think and quite rightly so it's, I think as I said for a country like India, the question of what the nature of engagement with these wider processes is and how one should attempt to direct it with the activity of government. I mean, I talked about these issues in Delhi and had a very good discussion of them there. It's complicated, I think, because, well, let me deal with Monsanto first of all. I mean, Monsanto certainly hasn't disappeared. And one of the things that really struck me about it was I listened to the speeches and read about the speeches of um, Shapiro, who was the CEO of Monsanto, in which he said, humbly, we did wrong, we did not listen to the, the, the consumers, uh, we thought we could simply foist genetically modified crops on people, proved not to be the case. But then I looked uh, only about six months ago at the Monsanto website, where they say the protesters are stupid and you know, they've got no sense and the only future is... So they didn't really change, it seems to me anyway, didn't really change their ethos as they should have done and they certainly haven't disappeared as a, as a force, although they have tried to merge with another uh, company, as you know, to partly disguise their name. I must say, I think in respect to the developing world, the, the debate about genetically modified crops, I think you have to see is an open one. I don't think we actually know, I mean, I certainly don't know, having looked at it as a layman might do, whether genetically modified crops do present the dangers that the protesters say and whether they might be beneficial to the developing world or not is not so clear. I mean, we know that uh, Monsanto tried to foist Terminator technologies on developing countries and they've since recoiled from that. So there are many issues in all that. And uh, to contest them, you certainly need power from the less developed parts of the world. And I think when you're talking about global governance, I think. Uh, India and other countries should form a full part of the world councils and India should, as a major power, play a basic role in the global order and at the moment still slanted towards the West. And We know that Western countries are often hypocritical about free trade because they proclaim the need for free trade. At the same time, they don't respect it because you've got the common agricultural policy and you've got restrictive practices among American farmers and so on. So we know there's a, a lot of hypocrisy there. But if you turn to the case of India, I think, in my view anyway, a lot of the problems India faces uh, are more to do with the state and government than with the global marketplace as such. Um, Indian economy has done better since the liberalization of the early 1990s than it did before. But India still has a lot of uh, corrupt, overextended, bureaucratic forms of government, both regionally and nationally, I think, which has to try to come to terms with, just like Brazil and some Latin American countries. As we know, in India you have an you know, amazing mix of the Bangalore phenomenon and then people mired in deepest poverty alongside that. But I think if you ask a question about is globalization producing these things, I, I, again I would still have to say the answer is no. And the question is how to get in rather than being left out. And this is the case with Africa, I think. Africa was of great concern during the Cold War period. 
because it, it was a kind of battleground between the Soviet Union and the United States or the two sides of the Cold War. Both sides lost interest in Africa with the ending of the Cold War when it no longer had that strategic importance. And Africa is essentially left outside. It seems to me the key thing for Africa is to bring it inside. And uh, if, if the, only, the only possibilities for effective development in poor African countries are internal reform coupled with external um, resources and aid. And some countries like Mozambique, Botswana, you know, they, they produce very effective structural reform starting from a very poor um, backdrop, much worse than India, I think, actually, in a general way, and have made effective um, development. So sh effective changes are possible, but disengagement is not the way, I think. And I think this is true for India as well. Please. Yes. Dr. Gibbons. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you were uh, preempted. Uh, preempted. Oh, over the last couple of days, I got to listen to your brief lectures on globalization. Well, they were actually called Runaway World. Yeah. Run runaway World. Yeah. I also got to listen to Dr. Kaplan's <clears throat> speech on what is entertainment by the beauties of the web. Well, he can speak for himself, I hope. <laughs> but in some sense, I'd like to bring up the, the issue of the confluence of those two because also in those last two days, I had a conversation with my mother who has always voted. But she told me on Sunday, she says, Jim, I don't think I'm going to vote this year. Now, if we have these profoundly important issues, I'm someone who'll get on the web and listen to your debates and participate. Entertainment, which reaches everyone and has a rule that says, you can't be boring. And I guess the only, what I want to raise here is, is there a way, do you think, that we can raise these very important issues, heaven forbid, to the level of entertainment, but significant entertainment, so that it's not just a few elites who read a few books, uh, who read a lot of books, and really bring in a full democracy, which includes a cosmopolitan democracy and public democracy, and that, that beautiful word, which needs more discussion, emotional democracy, but we won't get into that. Though. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a very interesting well, set of questions rather than just a single question. I mean, I don't think it's just, for me anyway, not primarily an issue of entertainment, actually. It's really a question of the, the, the double process that I mentioned of the media on the one hand vastly expanding, I think, the possible range of decisions which can be made publicly where you have, where citizens have a lot of information about them. And I think the expansion of media, the differentiation of different forms of media does have this effect. On the other hand, not just because of entertainment, there is, as I mentioned, this kind of relentless invasion of the very space that's opened up, which trivializes it, which refuses to engage with long-term issues and where in the very kind of era of globalization, as we know, you get more local news rather than uh, more international news. So at least, and this is only true, I think, however, of sort of core broadcasting media, but um, no doubt studies of news show that, you know, that you get more local issues rather than international issues. So we have to struggle about against all those things. Well, yeah, I think, I think we, we, politically, we do have to try to react to that situation. And I feel there are a number of, you know, it's a big question, lots of levels to it. If I can talk about the UK, I think there are quite straight down the line issues in the UK that are relevant to media space and democracy, which are simply media ownership. Um, large chunks of the British media are owned by two people, Rupert Murdoch and Conrad Black, who don't live in the country, who are not British nationals, who own several media outlets, this should not, in my view, this is not conducive to the democracy, in my view. So I think there are certain basic things still around media ownership which are relevant to this, and these are relevant on a transnational level as well, because you've got these giant conglomerates emerging, as we know, in the media industry. Can we control those? Well, I don't think we really know, but I think some effort should be made to do that. So there's all that. There's, there is, I think, a double impact of technology, because I think 
although it might be true in, in more core conventional broadcasting media that you do get a narrowing of issues and you get what I call media democracy, I think there are plenty of other media sources where this is not so actually, where you do get a much more informed citizenry than you had before. So I think you have a kind of dialectic there, really. Um, there are so many other angles on the question, you know, the, the use of media for democracy. We don't really know how far internet technologies, other technologies can be used for direct democratic means, you know. There, there are various experiments going on in local communities and nations around the world. In Singapore, which is only a democratic country, really, you can, nevertheless, there's an awful lot of material which is now put on uh, information which is directly available to the citizenry. citizenry. What would the impact of that be? We don't really know. So a lot of areas where we're in don't know territory around the theme of democracy. But I, I would go back to the theme that I mentioned, that this is, the, this is a world of incipient democratization, where the very same forces creating that are tending to threaten democracy. And we have to deal with the double implications of that situation. And I don't think any of us are completely clear about how to do that. There are big problems around it all, really, including the role of political parties and many other things. I don't have time to discuss. You might have been next in line. Okay. Now you have to in the last um, few centuries, we've seen the Western culture dominating world culture in a sense. We've seen the spread of Western media, Western modes of thought, and Western ideas dominate ideas on a global scale. Would you expect, expect that to continue in the next century, or would you think that perhaps ideas from other cultures, say China or India, would play a much greater, greater role in shaping intellectual thought. Well, that, that's also an excellent observation because it's plain that a good deal of the forces promoting a new global order come from the West, not just culturally but technologically. However, it's a, it's a big mistake, I think, to suppose that this is a simple relationship because even a big country like the United States is as much affected by the forces of globalization as India or other countries are around the world. So there's no country that stands outside of these forces. You couldn't simply say this is just some kind of generic American plot against the world. But uh, I feel actually that, that, that there's a much more mixed process, as I was saying also politically, than one might imagine about, say, um, uh, Americanization of culture. That, that globalization produces many kinds of local variants and local reactions. Some of these can be very powerful. Some of them can be noxious, like, for example, various kinds of fundamentalisms, which global electronic um, means uh, provide for. Uh, they're a, often a resistance to Americanization of culture. Um, so I think it's quite a mixed picture, really. But I think on the level of global power, I think the power of the United States is actually shrinking rather than growing, even though many people might say the opposite. And there are not many things that the U.S. can do in the world now without the support of other countries. Often, of course, these are Western countries, but I just feel we should encourage, especially left of center political leaders, to provide more structural equality in the, in the big uh, uh, economic and political councils of the world. I feel there's some move towards that with the creation of this um, new um, economic uh, grouping that involves India, Brazil, and a number of other countries that are previously excluded. But if you don't have equality in the, the councils of the world, you're certainly not going to get equality in the wider world society. Um, so there are many things to be struggled against in all of this, but the thing I'm really against is just invoking the term globalization in the way in which people used to do capitalism or, you know, all the blame it all on the Americans kind of syndrome. If the things you don't like in the world, you find some easy thing to blame it on. That, there's no future in that kind of reasoning. So certainly there's an imbalance of power, but at least we can try and do something about it, I feel, in a way which would benefit poorer countries. Really? Well, there's one here. I thought you were going to ask a question. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if you could credit or discredit Samuel Hunting Huntington's theory on the clash of civilizations and that globalization is going to cause the world break off the civilization and clashes and wars are going to happen along those fault lines in the future because of globalization. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's a fairly sophisticated theory, but I don't think it's very accurate because I don't think civilizations are, are holes in that way. And um, all civilizations have different interpretations. And uh, 
you often get dialogue between different fringes of what hunting calls civilizations as much as you get conflicts, it seems to me. So I don't really think it makes much sense, say, to talk of what happened in Bosnia or Kosovo as a, simply a clash between two civilizations. I think of it as much more bound up with the forces that I was describing, really, which produce kind of forms of fragmentation in different areas of the world. And so I, I don't really think, to me, it has a great deal of validity, that idea. But um, it's a controversial issue, of course.